Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. I love the name of Jesus, don't you? No other name compares to that wonderful, matchless, marvelous name, the name of Jesus. Thank you so much for pointing our hearts and minds to him. Last Sunday morning, we began, I began a series of messages I've entitled simply, Finding Christmas. Finding Christmas. And we looked together last Sunday morning at the account that is given to us, the most extensive account of the birth of the Lord Jesus, in Luke chapter 2. And in Luke chapter 2, we looked at uh, the reaction of the shepherds. It says in verse 15, it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven. The shepherds said one to another, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass which the Lord hath made known unto us. Then verse 16 says, And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. That word found implies that they had been on a search. They had left their place of occupation to go find that place that the angel had said to them they would find the Lord Jesus wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. You know, there are a lot of people looking for a lot of things in this world, but they're looking in all the wrong places. They're they're looking for joy. We talked about that last Sunday morning. They're looking for peace. They're looking for hope. They're looking for love, we'll talk about today. They're even looking for salvation, and they're trying to find it in places of their own making. They think that you might find that in some position you could have. They think you might find it in some possession you may own. They think you may find it in some pleasure that you may pursue, but all to no avail. Because the reality is love, joy, peace, hope, salvation, it's all found in a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. It's all found in the person of the Christ child. Now, I love the way the... Shepherds went on to respond. After they found him, it says then they went and made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning the child. And then it says just a few verses later that they worshiped and glorified and praised God. You know, I believe one of the, one of the true reactions of every born-again believer is witnessing and worshiping. I believe everybody who knows the Lord wants somebody else to know the Lord. And I believe everybody that knows the Lord wants to thank the Lord that we know the Lord. You know, I'm so glad and grateful for the example of these wonderful shepherds and encouragement to my own heart. And this morning, we're going to look at the subject, finding love. Finding love. Now, when I think of the word love, immediately one verse of scripture comes to my mind. Anybody got a guess? I knew some of you would guess it because you've been watching football games. John 3, 16. You say, what do football games have to do with it? Don't even worry about it. It's back in my day. There used to be somebody always have a sign, John 3, 16, in a football game. All right. John 3, 16. Would you please stand with me for the reading of God's word here in the third chapter of John? And we are going to zero in on that one verse this morning, the 16th verse of John chapter 3. And I'd like for us to read it out loud together in unison. If you don't have a Bible with us, you just look on the screen. You can read along with us. And I'd like for us to read in unison together this wonderful verse of the Bible. Maybe the most familiar verse of the entire Bible. You ready? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. <laughs> Boy, I, I don't know that you could, you could find the entire Bible wrapped up in one verse better than that one verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I remember when I was a boy, preacher, I came to North Carolina, I came to Kinston, North Carolina as a 17-year-old young man and heard Dr. B.R. Lakin preach. And he had a wonderful message. If you've never heard it, you ought to Google it this afternoon and listen to it on John 3.16. And uh, Lakin could, he was, just a, he was just a craftsman with words. 
he could just take you into the heavenlies. He said, if I could climb the highest mountain and ask God, how much do you love me? God would say, for God so loved the world. He said, if I was to go to the deepest part of the darkest jungle and yell out, how much do you love me? God would say, for God so loved the world. He said, a little boy was in Sunday school one morning and his teacher gave him a little nut and told him to crack it and open it up. And there inside of it was this verse of scripture. And she said to him, son, what'd you find? He said, oh, I found the gospel in a nutshell. <laughs> for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Would you bow your head with me and let's pray. And if you don't know the love of God personally today in your life, I pray today will be the day that you'll come to know how much God loves you, how much God gave for you, and how that God today would save you if you'd believe. Those of us that are saved, I pray that as a result of being together around the Bible, we'll love him more who loves us so. Father, we thank you today. We thank you for your word, Lord. Every word of the Bible is precious. We believe every word of the Bible is inspired of you, and we believe you preserved it for our generation. But Lord, there is probably no greater verse maybe than my understanding in this wonderful verse. And I don't think I probably can do it fully justice this morning. In just a few moments. But I want to this day point people to you. John would later write in his first epistle, God is love. Lord, if we could define you today, one of the words we would define you with is love. You love us. You love me. You love the world. And so today, I pray that those without Christ might come to know him. Those of us that know you, Lord, I pray today we'll love you more, serve you better. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. Christina Rossetti, a great poet of yesteryear, wrote a poem the opening line of that poem is, love came down at Christmas, love all lovely, love divine. You know, God's love for us is an unconditional, incomparable love. When Paul was writing to the church at Corinth in the second epistles, chapter number nine and verse number 15, he, he said, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. You know, God's love this morning knows no limits. It, it has no boundaries. It knows no ending. <laughs> and I don't think there's a way as finite beings like you and I, we could fully ever comprehend or explain. As Paul said to the Ephesians, what is the breadth and the depth and the height <laughs> of the love of God? And yet this one verse, I believe, in one little tiny capsule proclaims to us the fact that God loves us. It, it tells us this morning that God gave for us. And it tells us that God will save any who believe. Someone has said that in these few words is an ocean of thought in a drop of language. The context of this verse is the Lord Jesus talking with Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a ruler of the Jews. He is a man who is well respected among the Pharisees, verse 1 tells us of chapter 3. He comes to Jesus at the end of a busy day and yet not so long that he doesn't want to spend time with this wonderful teacher he has heard about. He says to Jesus in verse 2, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher. Come from God for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus gets to the heart of the matter. He says there in verse number three, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus knew that in the heart of this highly religious Pharisee was a hunger 
in his heart to know the Lord, to know him personally. See, I believe in the heart of every person who's ever been born in this earth. God puts a little hole in our hearts, a little place where he wants to be in our lives. And all of us have a desire to know him. Jesus declares to John here the pathway of the new birth. He says in verse 7 of chapter 3, Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. Boldly declared that he was God and that he had been sent from God on a mission. That mission was to become our sacrifice. Notice how he worded it to Nicodemus there in chapter 3 of John in verse 14 as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. He went back to the account that's found in the book of Numbers in chapter 21 where the nation of Israel was in disobedience to God and murmuring, complaining against God and God sent poisonous snakes among them. Moses went to the Lord to say, is there some way with people's lives could be saved? Is there some way that there could be hope and help? And so many of our loved ones are dying. And Jesus told him to make a brazen serpent, to raise it up on a pole. And he said, whoever looks to the serpent will live. As a matter of fact, if you see much to do with the medical field, even in our day, you look on the side of an ambulance or an EMS vehicle, you'll often find that brazen serpent raised on a pole, pointing back to the one who would come. That's what it was doing. He's saying there's one who is coming who will be lifted up and he will die for the sins of mankind and everybody, everybody can look and live. I love that old hymn, look and live, my brother, live. Look to Jesus now and live. Jesus, in that conversation with this highly religious man, presents this declaration and demonstration of the omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent God, loving, sinful, fallen men. He presents it in such plain language. None of the words are hard to understand. He says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I want you to see with me this morning three aspects of God's love as we think about finding love. First of all, I want you to notice with me the passion of God's love. Look there again. For God so loved. So loved. In two short but strong words, God describes the potency of his love. These two words, so love, set before us a glimpse into the eternal heart of God for mankind. And these two words, so love, God says straightforwardly and simply that he loves you, that he loves me, and that his love is not partial, it is full, it is complete, it is sincere, it is entire. You, you can't go back in time this morning to any place in eternity and ever find a moment when God did not love you. you. You cannot go into any moment of time in eternity future and find a spot where God will not love you. As a matter of fact, Jeremiah, the prophet, in chapter 31 of his prophecy, in verse number 3, says this is what he was told of the Lord of old. Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. <laughs> this morning, God unconditionally loves 
you. When I think about his love, I'm certainly aware that there's nothing in me that would attract that love. I've never given God a reason to love me as a depraved, defiled, and often disgraceful person. The truth is, this morning, God should rather loathe me than love me. However, he has chosen of his own free will and volition to love us. That love surpasses our understanding, our explanation. If I try to describe that love today with some earthly love, it would pale in insignificance. You may say, well, you don't know how much my husband loves me. You don't know how much my wife loves me. I I may not, but I know this. I I know when you set that earthly love beside God's eternal love, that that earthly love just falls into insignificance. You say, you don't have any idea how much my mother loves me or my father loves me. And and I may not fully understand that. but, But I know this. I know that God loves you far more than anyone or anything could ever express love towards you. God loves you. Sir, God loves you. Ma'am, God loves you. Young person, God loves you. I I wish I had the time this morning. I'd start over here on the front row and and, and go down each row and just look at you face to face, eyeball to eyeball, and, and say to you this morning, God loves you. 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 Listen to me this morning. The the love of God is a passionate love for God. So loved. But it's not only unconditional, it's universal. For God so loved the world. The world. That, That word world here in our text is talking about all the people on the planet. See, God's love this morning He's not just unconditional, he's universal, and it's inclusive. God loves Jews today. God loves Greeks. God loves Ethiopians today. God loves Egyptians today. God loves Persians today. God loves Turks today. God loves Japanese today. God loves Canadians today. God loves Chinese today. God loves Serbians today. God loves French. God loves the English. God loves the Russians. And God loves the Brazilians. And God loves the Americans. Sometimes we get so caught up in where we are and who we are. We forget that God loves the entire world. He loves the civilized as well as he loves the savage. He loves the millionaire as much as he loves the pauper. He loves the educated as much as he loves the unlearned. He loves those that live in freedom today like you and I do politically and those that are bound under some dictator today. See, the bottom line is this. God loves all people everywhere. God loves all people of colors, all conditions, all circumstances, all castes, all classes, all characters, all companies. There's no one excluded and everyone is included. God's never overlooked somebody. You and I have, haven't we? Maybe not intentionally. You ever overlooked somebody accidentally and later somebody rebuked you because you overlooked them? <laughs> I remember years ago now, we had somebody get upset at Sharon and I because they saw us in a store and we didn't speak to them. Well, the problem is they saw us. We didn't see them. I promise you, I've never knowingly shied away from somebody I know <laughs> and overlooked them, but, but not intentionally. Hey, but God's never done it anyway. God, 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 God's never omitted anybody. 
Someone described God's love with these words. It reaches behind every prison bar into slavery where men and women live in such filth, so vile it would nauseate even the hardest, uh, most hardened social worker. It, it reaches into the pit of sin where we have fallen, uh, men have fallen lower than the beast. It reaches into the icy huts of Greenland's mountain. It flows into the Orient to, to water the lives of India's teeming billions. It, it, it flows into the lovely jungles of a lonely jungles of Africa to quiet the soul of the savage. God's love is abundant. It's supply so inexhaustible that it is above all and for all. God loves. Can I tell you this morning? God doesn't just love us collectively. God loves us individually. He loves you right where you're at today. You say, oh, pastor, if you only knew what's going on in my life. God knows and still loves you. Now, sometimes we don't react that way. I admit, as a human being, sometimes when I know certain things, it's hard to love some people. And you know, some people are just lovely and lovely, and they're easy to love. You, you know some people like that, don't you? Well, of course you do. You know me. Uh, but, but I'm talking about other people, okay? We, we all know some people that are just easy to love. And then there's some little people, there's some people a little more difficult to love. They're a little brash. They're a little harsh. They speak their mind and they're proud of it. <laughs> you, know? you know, I'm glad this morning God doesn't look on the outer man and decide whether he loves you. God loves you today because of who you are. So, so we, we see the passion of God's love. S secondly, then, I want you to see the provision of God's love. The provision. Notice it there with me. You're in John 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God gave his son. You, you know what gifts are? Gifts are an expression of our emotions. Gifts are an expression of our feelings. We, we, we give to people most of the time now. I would admit there are a few times that you, people give for other reasons, okay? But most of the time we give because we love. I love Sharon. I've loved her for many, many years now. We've known each other for, oh, well, let's see, 47 years. Been married 43 years. I've given to her many, many times. I don't get to an occasion like her birthday or anniversary or, or um, Christmas and think, well, you know what? I've given to her enough. And I certainly never get to a spot where I think, you know what? She's given to me enough. Because gifts is my, one of my love languages. If you're familiar with Chapman's book, one of my love languages is gifts. So gifts speak to me. But I think gifts speak to everyone. Because gifts are an expression of emotion. God gave out a genuine, true compassion and benevolence toward mankind. His gift, giving, is like no other giving. As a matter of fact, sometimes we have a subtle reason to give. If I give to you, you'll give to me. <laughs> right? If I give some, you'll give more because you have better capacity. But God's giving is an overflow of his loving character. When you think about how God gave, it, it, it's mind-boggling to me. God didn't give to people he knew who would return his love. He gave to people like you and me. He gave because he loves us. I love that verse over in Romans chapter 5. But God commendeth his love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners. God didn't give to saints. God gave to sinners. In that yet while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He gave voluntarily. He gave freely. His gift was quite expensive. 
Just, just think about what Paul said to the Corinthians, that, that he who was rich became poor. He, he who had known only the glory world came into this gory world. He, he left a glorious place that had no sin, no sorrow, no shame, no suffering to come into this grievous place where there is sin and suffering and sorrow and shame. That, that word gave is an interesting word that is in this verse. It has the sense of giving up, the force of giving up. In other words, when, when, when God sent Jesus into Bethlehem's manger, he knew that the manger wasn't the end of the earthly pilgrimage of our Lord. He knew that he would be raised in a carpenter's home, that as a young boy, he'd be taught a trade by his, his uh, foster dad, Joseph. He, he knew that he would go through uh, years of his life where he would really be basically unknown, living in obscurity though he was the God of all glory. He knew that when he appeared on the scene in his, in his ministry years, uh, that he would be mocked, that he would be rejected, that people would, would, would curse him and spit on him and, and mistreat him. He knew he'd ultimately be lied about. He'd be whipped with a kid, cat, uh, with a, with a, te, with a, Cat of nine tails. He knew that they would pull his beard from his face. They would mock him as the king with a purple robe. He, he knew he would be led out of the city of Jerusalem to a little place right outside the Damascus gate. And there he'd be crucified. He knew that all of his disciples that he invested so much of his life in, that they would all forsake him in that hour except for John. He knew all of that. But he gave. He did not withhold because of what Jesus would experience, but he gave his only begotten son. He was the divine son of God. He, he was the distinct son of God. Notice, notice the phraseology there in verse 16, that he gave his only begotten son. That, that terminology, that description's used five times in the gospel of John. It, it doesn't mean that he was begotten as in the sense of having a birth or a beginning, but rather it distinguishes him as the unique son of God. He has no equal. Dr. R.G. Lee, who pastored the Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee in the last century for many scores of years, he, he has a sermon entitled The Only Begotten of the Father. And, and this is what he said. He said, you may put aside, you may put side by side, play and Socrates, Peter and Paul, Luther and Wycliffe, Lincoln and Lee, Beethoven and Mendelssohn. There's no name so great in the history of the world that it may not be equaled by another. But when you mention Jesus, there's no one to stand beside him. He stands alone. He stands august. He stands supreme. He stands unique. He is forever the great unlike. His name is above all name. And with him, no mortal can compare. And God gave him for us. God sent him for me. God gave him for you. What wondrous love. What an amazing gift that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Not only do we see the passion of God's love, the provision of God's love, look at me one last aspect, the promise of God's love. 
The latter part of verse 16 says that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I believe one of the greatest words in all the Bible is that word whosoever. You say, why is it so great, Pastor? I believe it's great, first of all, because it applies to everybody. If you look down just in the next two verses with me in John 3, would you please? It says, verse 17, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. The reality is everybody's condemned until they believe. Why? Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that seeketh after God. This morning, God loves you in spite of the fact of who you and I are. He reaches everyone with that word whosoever. He overlooks no one. That word is general, and yet that word is particular. That, that word embraces all people, and that word touches every single person. Because it doesn't just mean everybody, it means anybody. It means you, it means me. It, it, whosoever believeth in him. This all-inclusive message of the gospel is in some way exclusive. What do you mean, Pastor? I mean there's no other way to be saved. If you do not believe in him, that's Jesus, you will not be saved. M mankind has developed and devised all types of ways to be saved. Good works, baptism, good moral living, church attendance. You enlist them. But, but you know what they all have in common? They, they all have in common the word do. You do this, 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 you do this. And, and sooner or later, surely you'll merit some standing with God. That stands in direct opposition to what God declares. God declares it's all done through the person and work of Jesus Christ on the cross, being buried and being raised again from the dead. It's not what you do, it's what Christ has already done. And if you believe on him, if you trust him, whosoever believeth in him. Jesus said it this way in the 14th chapter of John, verse number six, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It's not just faith though, it's faith in him. R.A. Torrey said to believe on the Lord Jesus means to put your confidence in him as what he claims to be. It's to put your confidence in him, Tory said, as your sin bearer, as your deliverer from the power of sin, as your master who has the right to the entire control of your life, as your guide whom you'll follow wherever he leads, and as your divine Lord. The moment you put your confidence in Jesus Christ, that very moment you are born again. That whosoever believeth in him, starts off with a negative, should not perish. What does that mean? That means that everyone who does not believe in him will perish. Now, God doesn't want anybody to perish. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, 
Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You, you, know, you know what the greatest tragedy about hell this morning is? Nobody had to go. Nobody. Because Jesus loves everybody and died for everybody. And anybody who believes on him, he, believe, he, he, he redeems them. The greatest tragedy about eternal punishment and being separated and perishing forever is nobody had to go there. But the glorious reality is for those who believe on him, we have everlasting life. An endless fullness and glory that began the moment I got saved, the Holy Spirit moved in me. That life from above it's not only life that comes from him, but it's life in him, and it's inseparable for who he is because everlasting life is the present possession of every born-again believer. But the term also speaks of eternal glory. When you and I will gather around the throne of God and we'll join the untold millions singing worthy is the lamb that was slain. Why? Not because of our merit, but because of the merit of the lamb, the son of God, who took on himself the sin of the world. My favorite Christmas story, I've told it before, and God gives me life, I'll probably tell it again. It's about the little boy, homeless little boy on the cold, dark streets of Chicago, selling newspaper for a few pennies, hoping to gather up enough that he could somehow survive another day. He saw a policeman standing on the corner, cold winter night. He said to him, sir, do you know a place where a little boy can get warm? It's so cold out here. He said, oh, yes, son, I know a place. And he said, you go down this street here, go down four blocks, and on the left, there's a house sitting. It's a big house. It's got a big porch. You, you walk up to the house, and you knock on the door. When you knock on the door, someone's going to come to the door. And they're going to say, may I help you, please? And you're going to say, John 3, verse 16. He said, that's the password to get in the house. He said, sir, now what was it again? Tell me again. He said, it's John 3, verse 16. Okay. So I just say, John 3, verse 16, they're going to let me in. He said, oh, yes, son. I promise you they're going to let you in. Well, he made his way down there. Knocked on the door. A gentleman came to the door. He looked down at him and said, son, can I help you? He said, John 3, verse 16. He said, come right in. He said, it was a large house. What he noticed most was it was a warm house. He thought in his heart, I, I don't know what John 3 verse 16 is, but it'll get a little cold boy in a warm house. The man said to him, son, you look like you're hungry. He said, oh, he said, sir, I, I ain't had a decent meal in weeks. Just sell a few papers and get a few pennies and Give me a little something. He said, son, would you, would you like a full meal? He said, a full meal? He said, yes, sir. He said, well, come right in here. And took him into the dining room. And someone brought out turkey and dressing, cranberry sauce and green beans and mashed taters. Probably wasn't that in Chicago, but it is in my story. Mashed taters. <laughs> Gravy. Corn just looking 
man says, oh, get anything you want. Eat till your heart's content, son. Little boy sat there eating. He said, I don't know what John 3, verse 16 is, but it sure will fill up a hungry boy. He got through eating and man said, son, he said, would you like a bath? He said, a bath? He said, yeah. Would you like a bath? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir, you already fed me, but yes, sir, if I could get a bath, I'll take a bath. He said, well, let's go up and went up and stairs. Went in a nice bedroom there. Had a bathroom off of it. One of those tubs back in those days with the claw feet on the bottom. He went over and drew hot water for the little boy. Put him some bubble bath in it. Gave him some soap, some shampoo. He said, now, son, just... You bathe as long as you want to bathe. You get as clean as you can get. Said, you just enjoy this, son. Said, I, I'll come back in a little while and see if you need anything. Little boy sitting there, bathtub, scrubbing, enjoying life. He said, I sure don't know what John 3 verse 16 means. But he said, it'll get a dirty boy clean. Sure enough, the man came back in a little while. He said, son, would you, would, you, would you like to have a good night of rest? He said, oh, sir, I said, I just sleep wherever I can find a little, little place in the sidewalk. He said, oh, I'd love to sleep on like a bed you're talking about. He said, oh, yes, son. Took him in that, that bathroom, into that bedroom, big bed there, warm covers, Big pillows. He laid down there and went to sleep. And as he went to sleep that night, the little boy thought, I sure don't know what John 3 verse 16 means, but it'll get a tired boy a good place to rest. Got up the next morning. Sure enough, that same man Came knocked on the door. He said, son, can I, can I get you something for breakfast? He said, yes, sir, you can. He said, but, but can I ask you one question? He said, yes, sir. Yes, son, you can ask me a question. He said, it must be powerful, whatever it is. But he said, I don't have any idea what John 3 verse 16 means. Sir, what does that mean? He sat down there and opened a little New Testament with the boy. And he showed him, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Went through and explained the gospel to that young boy. He bowed his head and trusted Christ as his Savior. You say, well, that's not me. I'll tell you, it is you. If you're here without Christ, you're lost in the coldness and deadness of your sin. If you're here without Christ, you're, you're filthy and you need cleaning. If you're here without Christ, you're empty and you need filling. If you're here without Christ, you're weary and you need rest. And let me tell you where it's found. It's all found in John 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You looking for love this Christmas season? I'll tell you where it's found. It's found in that little babe that's born in a manger who would grow up to be sacrificed and crucified for your sins and mine. Who'd be laid in a cold, dead tomb. But on that third morning, he'd come up from the grave. And because he lives, we too can live. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed.